Hello you guys, hi, welcome to another study with me. Um, I've finished three of my 10 exams, seven to go. Um, the drama one was really good yesterday, very happy about that, and the class of ones. But today I'm going to be talking about my next exam, which is on the 3rd of June, which is um, the prose literature comparison with um, in English literature. So I am doing Frankenstein and the Handmaid's Tale. I have a whole bunch of essay plans, this bit, yeah. Not double-sided, but you know. And I thought I'd just talk through them pretty much. Um, they're not definitive. I'm not promising they're brilliant, but they're just what I've come up with. Um, so let's have a look. So the first one I thought of was fear. Um, so here's my introduction. In both Frankenstein and The Handmaid's Tale, we have novels that ignore different types of fear and seek to inspire fear in many different ways. In Frankenstein, we have the more conventional Gothic style of fear, the idea of Shelley creating a monstrous figure, much like the monstrous figures in other Gothic works like Bram Stoker's Dracula and Robert Louis Stevenson's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, for the audience and other characters within the play to fear. And this is exactly what she does with the creature. However, this fear does not remain conventional when we consider the fact that Shelley does not seek entirely to make her creature terrifying. She doesn't make him an inequivocal evil because she makes us empathise with him. Rather, in her novel, Shelley seeks to inspire fear within the reader for what could happen in real life. She removes the majority of the fantastical element of gothic fear and instead replaces it with real life fears, such as the advancement of science and its effects on religion. Atwood does a very similar thing, not seeking to terrify the audience from a superficial level, but to make them think. As she says, the author's role is to educate and she seeks to inspire the fear of what could happen should science or religion go too far because of apathy. Everything that she puts in place in the fictional theocracy of Gilead has a real life precedent. As she says herself, and this is a direct quote, every single one of the practices described in the novel is drawn from the historical record. The removal of women's abortion rights from Ceausescu's Romania or the enforced use of uniforms for women through the Chador in Taliban-controlled territory. Through this, we can see that both authors seek to explore the effects of fear and to inspire it within their reader. And thus, fear comes to be a very important aspect of both novels. So the first thing I'd look at with fear is sort of authorial purpose when it comes to fear. So primarily when we consider fear, we must consider the notion of authorial purpose when it comes to that theme. Shelley seeks to inspire fear within the reader because she's writing a ghost story. And this is very typical of gothic fiction and is impressed both within her prologue to her novel and within her novel itself. So she says in her prologue, I busied myself to think of a story, one which would speak to the mysterious fears of our nature and awaken thrilling horror. One to make the reader dread to look round, to curdle the blood and quicken the beatings of the heart. And even when we get to the last uh, letters of Walton, he says to his sister, Margaret, you have read this strange and terrific story, Margaret, and do you not feel your blood congeal with horror like that which even now curdles mine? In relative contrast, Atwood writes speculative fiction where she voices her fears of what is happening and what could happen if the society which she sees evident in her own life moves to extremes in the future. When she found that The Handmaid's Tale had been awarded a prize for science fiction, she took issue with this and is quoted as saying that speculative fiction encompasses that which we could actually do, while sci-fi is that which we're probably not going to see. And Atwood is extremely careful to ensure that the reader knows that this could happen by harking back to a time before Gilead, just like ours, where everything could so be easily be manipulated. She warns against apathy. So we've got um, a indirect quote from Offred's mother when she says to Offred in the time before, you young people don't appreciate things. You don't know what we had to go through just to get you where you are. Look at him slicing up the carrots. Don't you know how many women's lives, how many women's bodies the tanks had to roll over just to get that far? So Atwood is definitely warning against apathy. That's part of her speculative fiction purpose because she's showing people what could happen. And, and it's all very logical. All of this could very easily happen in our own society, trying to get people to think and warn them against apathy. She's making them fear things because they. she shows how they could happen. Whereas Shelley seeks the more fantastical element of gothic, gothic fiction, but within that she brings in fears about science. 
And then we have something about um, the digitization of money. Um, Atwood does not like credit cards. And she shows this in her novel. So she says, I guess that's how they were able to do it in the way they did all at once without anyone knowing beforehand. If there had still been portable money, it would have been more difficult. Indeed, apathy is certainly the reason why Atwood says that she set her book in Cambridge, Massachusetts, stating in an interview with the New York Times that you often hear in North America, it can't happen here. But it happened quite early on. The Puritans banished people who didn't agree with them. So we would rather be rather smug to assume that the seeds are not there. That's why I set the book in Cambridge. Through this, we can certainly see that Atwood and Shelley both seek to inspire fear within their readers, but these seem to come from very different areas. Shelley wants to inspire fear in her audience of the fictional creation of her monster as typical gothic fiction, while Atwood wants to present to her audience just how easily what has happened in the fictional Gilead could happen in the real world, and thus she inspires fear of what could so easily happen through her speculative fiction. In this, the different genres that the two novels fall into seem to dictate the author's approaches to inspiring fear within the readers. That is a very surface level, well, it's not surface level, but I'd say that's quite a simplistic route. If you want to go down a different route, you could say, but through her gothic fiction, Shelley does explore real life fears, much like Atwood, where she's exploring the fears of um, the use of science like Luigi Galvani in her time when he was uh, reanimating frog's legs through the use of electricity. She's very anxious about this idea of people um, breaking into the bounds of God uh, trying to make themselves into God and that's certainly what Victor tries to do. Okay so then we have science's power, the fear of science's power. Both novels also present ideas of fear of the power of science which seem to come in two distinct camps. The first of these would be the fear of science's power against nature which we witness in both novels very clearly. We can see this primarily in Frankenstein through the use of the rape metaphor for what Victor seeks to do to mother nature. There is extended use of the verb penetrate, and thus we can see that he, as the agent of science, seeks to ultimately violate nature, described and presented as a woman, for his own material gain. So we have many examples of this, not necessarily just Victor, also just scientists in general. So two that I've picked out are Victor saying, I have described myself as always having been imbued with a fervent longing to penetrate the secret of nature and then the second one we have um a lot about general science general scientists so they penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places through this portrayal of ultimate violation as a metaphor for what Victor does in his scientific overreaching, we can see that Shelley certainly seeks to present just how powerful science is in relation to nature. And the fact that it essentially seeks to completely destroy it. This most definitely presents a fear of science's power over nature which is certainly echoed within The Handmaid's Tale through Atwood's description of the colonies. Atwood herself is an environmental activist, speaking regularly at the, con the conferences of the Canadian Green Party and being a prominent member of Greenpeace, an environmental charity. She has also said that our greatest moral debt is to the environment, and she certainly presents this anxiety over science's effects on nature within her novel. Having witnessed the rapid expansion of nuclear power lobbies and the disastrous effects of its failings, for example, the Three Mile Nuclear Disaster in 1979 and after she wrote her novel, the Chernobyl Disaster in 1986, which produced horrifying images of workers melted to their chairs and had wide ranging and long lasting effects, such as the continued birth effects in Belarus, rather a long way away from the accident, which have been explicitly linked to the disaster. In the way that Atwood describes the colonies, she certainly shows the complete danger of science when it is pitted against nature. So we have an example from when she's talking about the colonies. She says, they reckon you've got about three years maximum until your nose falls off and your skin peels away like rubber gloves. It's very grotesque imagery. So this grotesque presentation of the effects of science upon nature certainly present a fear of scientific power and its capabilities, which both novelists seem to share. As well as, as well as this, both novels seemed to fear the effects of science in conjunction with religion, although these fears come about in rather different ways. Shelley, living in a deeply religious society in 1800s England, figures that science poses a genuine threat towards religious practice, and she emphasises this in her introduction to her novel. 
So she says in her preface, uh, when she's talking about how the novel, the idea for the novel came to her, she says, I saw with shut eyes, but acute mental vision, I saw the pale student of unhallowed arts kneeling beside the thing he had put together. I saw the hideous phantasm of a man stretched out and then on the working of some powerful engine, show signs of life and stir within an uneasy, half vital motion. Frightful must it be, for supremely frightful would be the effect of any human endeavour to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. Through this, we can see that Shelley greatly fears the impact of science upon religion and the fact that science has the capability to allow human beings to mock God, which is exactly what Victor seeks to do and successfully does in his creation of the creature. So he says a new species would bless me as its creator and source. He's very much trying to make himself into a God. Here, Shelley seems to view science and religion as entirely incompatible in her religious society, just as Gilead viewed the two aspects in the same way. Science threatens Gilead's religion, or religion, and so must be entirely gotten rid of. This is exactly how Gilead presents science, as something to be feared and as something that must be entirely avoided when considering religious practice. But Atwood, through this, seems to emphasise that the removal of science from all aspects of life is also a bad thing. Through this, she advocates Kate's moderation and fears what the removal of science could do when replaced by fervent religion. So we are told when she sees the doctors hanging from the wall. These men, we've been told, are like war criminals. It's no excuse that what they did was legal at the time. Their crimes are retroactive. They have committed atrocities and must be made into examples for the rest. And then we also have one where they're talking about how at the Red Centre they were shown a video of a woman in labour. What she'd showed us was a, was a film made in an olden days hospital, a pregnant woman wired up to a machine, electrodes coming out of her every which way so that she looked like a broken robot, an intravenous drip feeding into her arm. Through this, we can see a clear fear presented by the authors of science in re relation to religion, but these are slightly different. Shelley fears the potential for overreaching of religion that science affords, while Atwood is anxious to avoid the complete removal of science in favour of religious power. So then finally, I'd consider paranoia, um, the power of fear. Finally, we must, of course, consider the power of fear in relation to what the characters within the novel feel. Both Offred and Victor show signs of severe paranoia whenever they interact with other people because they both entirely mistrust their surroundings. Victor sees the creature everywhere, accusing him, and Offred sees the eyes everywhere. Victor's fear is self-imposed, but it certainly presents the power of fear for one's own safety and the effects of fear in his paranoia. So he says, although the sun shone upon me as upon the happy and gay of heart, I saw around me nothing but a dense and frightful darkness, penetrated by no light but the glimmer of two eyes that glared upon me. Victor sees enemies everywhere, his creature and the accusing eyes of his best friend Clerval, whose death was caused by Victor's own creation. And through this, we can see the clear power of fear and the presentation of paranoia. In The Handmaid's Tale, this paranoia is similar, but it is also used as a power tactic by the Republic of Gilead. Gilead enforced this paranoia upon their people because it is the most effective method of control. They arrest a man in public with no warning and entirely uncalled for violence just to get into people's heads. And they even call their spies the eyes, all to get into people's heads and prevent them from rebelling. And this is exactly what Offred suffers from. So when she's talking to Nick at the start of the novel, um, we have him make a joke and she says perhaps he was merely being friendly perhaps he saw the look on my face and mistook it for something else perhaps it was a test to see what I would do perhaps he is an eye so the repetition of perhaps the anaphoric repetition really emphasizes that Offred has no idea what she should do Offred is terrified Offred's paranoid she doesn't know who to trust we also have the use of the um decided um, chosen words. So we have uh, the standard greetings that the handmaids use to each other. So they always say under his eye. And obviously that generally means God, but under his eye, it makes you feel like everyone's always watching you. And as well as this, uh, when Aunt Lydia says to the handmaids as they're being trained, the Republic of Gilead sent Aunt Lydia knows no bounds. Gilead is within you. So it's very much insular, very much kept within. Through this, we can certainly see that both novels explore the power of fear to subdue people and especially the notion of paranoia. Alfred and Victor never feel entirely safe because of their fear. And this is made very, very clear. 
So overall, we can see that Frankenstein and The Handmaid's Tale both figure as very important texts within the exploration of the theme of fear. Both novelists seek to inspire fear within their reasons, readers, but for many different reasons. Both present clear fear of science's power in relation to religion and nature, although outward suggests fear of the lack of use of science too, and we see the power of fear upon our two protagonists. Through this, I would certainly agree that both novelists explore fear in equally important and similar ways. So that's fear done. That was quick. Um, then we have storytelling. Now, I think it's actually a really interesting one to look at. I really think this could come up because the idea of narrative and stuff, that's obviously very important. But storytelling, you've got how they both tell their stories very differently. Uh, they're both very different uh, narrators, despite some similarities you might see between them, which we will go into. So in both Frankenstein and The Handmaid's Tale, we have different and varied approaches to storytelling. Both novels have first person narrators, both have multiple narratives, and both figure as clear cautionary tales, and both have very open endings. In this, it could certainly be suggested that Shelley and Atwood take a very similar approach to storytelling. So first, we're going to look at unreliable narrators, which I think is an amazing point. And if you can make it for anything, make it, because it's it's a nice point to remember. It's a nice point to make. It shows that you understand the writer's craft, and it shows that you have a very discriminating view between the two types of unreliable narrative, which we'll get into. So both texts present unreliable narrators in the form of their protagonists, but this unreliability arises for very different reasons. In Frankenstein, Victor is unreliable because he seeks to show himself in the best light and his creature in the worst. He is certainly biased and has an agenda that works clearly against the truth, and this is presented in the way that Walton speaks about his friend's narrative. So we are told by Walton after Frankenstein has spoken everything that um, Victor changed some things as, as he's wont to do. So Frankenstein discovered that I made notes concerning his history. He asked to see them and then himself corrected and augmented them in many places, but principally in giving the life and spirit to the conversations he held with his enemy. I would not that a mutilated one should go down to posterity. Now, this is very interesting because it's basically Walton openly admitting that the story that he has told is not necessarily true because Victor has altered it. And as we've got to know Victor, we know for a fact that he is not the most reliable man. So he, if he's edited the conversations he had with the creature, he's obviously tried to make himself look better. Obviously, that hasn't worked because we still don't like him. But you know, he's tried, he's tried to change how he looks. He's been a very unreliable narrator. And also Victor says to Walton uh, about the creature, he is eloquent and persuasive and wants his words had even power over my heart, but trust him not. So he tells him not to trust the creature when in reality, Walton shouldn't be trusting him. Through this, we can certainly see that Victor is a highly unreliable narrator, and so is Offred within The Handmaid's Tale. However, in great contrast to Victor, Offred is an unreliable narrator because she is so ignorant of what is going on in Gilead. As a handmaid, and so perhaps the most oppressed member of the society, aside from those who are in the colonies, she has no access to news. She is not allowed to read, for example, and the only news she actually gets is probably unreliable propaganda from the Gileadian state. She is extremely apologetic for her narrative unreliability throughout the novel. She says, here is what I'd like to tell. I'd like to tell a story about how Moira escaped for good this time. But as far as I know, that didn't happen. I don't know how she ended or even if she did, because I never saw her again. And then we have a lovely metaphor that you'll know, um, sorry, a simile, that you'll know if you've read the book because it's gorgeous. Um, I'm sorry there is so much pain in this story. I'm sorry it's in fragments like a body caught in a crossfire or pulled apart by force, but there is nothing I can do to change it. We later find out that the narrative is not only unreliable because of the fact that Offred quite simply knows nothing, but that it is also unreliable because the professors who came to possession of Offred's tapes of her story rearranged them themselves. So we're told in the historical notes, the tapes were arranged in no particular order, being loose at the bottom of the box, nor were they numbered. It was up to Professor Wade and myself, myself is Professor P. Soto, to arrange the blocks of speech in the order in which they appeared to go. Through this, we cannot we cannot even say that we have an authentic offred because her story is passed down to us through vehicle of the thoughts and decisions of men who did not know her at all. 
In this, we have clear examples of unreliable narrators, but they are unreliable for very different reasons. Then we have cautionary tales. So both novels certainly figure as cautionary tales, but they are definitely against different things. Frankenstein becomes a novel which warns against scientific overreaching against God through the use of science. And this is certainly something that Mary Shelley was very concerned about. Having, vi having visited the lectures of Monsieur Garner in with her husband in London, when he spoke of galvanism, the practice of bringing dead matter back to life through the use of electricity, Shelley saw the capabilities that science was only just now beginning to break in upon, and they deeply worried her as they worried many people. She even says so in her preface that she fears the notion that someone like Victor would seek to usurp God through the use of scientific power. I'm not going to read the whole quote out again. It's the same quote in the preface. I'll just read out the important part. Frightful, Mr. E, for supremely frightful will be the effect of any human endeavour to mock the stupendous mechanism of the creator of the world. Shelley herself has Victor exhibit himself as a cautionary tale in his moments of self-realisation, that what he has done is blameable and awful, and these are few and far between. So he says, but I am a blasted tree. The bolt has entered my soul, and I felt then that I should survive to exhibit what I should soon cease to be, a miserable spectacle of wrecked humanity, pitiable to others and intolerable to myself. He becomes a bit like the um, ancient rhyme of the ancient mariner, the ancient mariner in that poem, where he goes around with the albatross around his neck and tells people of his story. And um, he also gives a little novel, uh, a little moral, sorry, to uh, Walton. Seek happiness in tranquility and avoid ambition, even if it be only the apparently innocent one of distinguishing yourself in science and discoveries. Within The Handmaid's Tale, Atwood also presents a cautionary tale, but this comes from a much different standpoint. Rather than warning against the dangers of trespassing against God through science, Atwood seeks to warn about apathy in the environment, two things that she is extremely concerned about in her political activism. She has said herself that a voice is a human gift and that silence and powerlessness go together. And she warns greatly against the dangers of apathy which have allowed Gilead to happen and which allowed the rise of the new right in America with politicians such as Phyllis Schlafly. So, um... Again, we've got the mother's quote from before, you young people don't appreciate things. And then what about Moira? When Moira, uh, when she comes across Moira again in the red set, in, in Jezebel's, Moira is not as courageous as she used to be. So she says, how can I expect her to go on with my idea of her courage, live it through, act it out, when I myself do not? She also warns in her novel against the abuse of the environment, which is something that she is extremely passionate about, it being the subject of many of her novels, Oryx and Crake, for example, that whole series, and with her being part of the Canadian Green Party and Greenpeace. She has says that herself that her mor our greatest moral debt is to the environment, and this is exactly one of the warnings that she explores in The Handmaid's Tale. They figure you've got three years maximum of those before your nose falls off and your skin pulls away like rubber gloves. Through this, we can certainly see that both novels figure as cautionary tales, but for very different things. The Handmaid's Tale for apathy in the environment and Frankenstein for the negatives of science. Then we have open endings. So finally, both novels have very open endings, leaving the readers to fill in what happens in our own minds. This allows for great speculation and audience engagement. So we're told he was soon borne away by the waves and lost in darkness and distance in Frankenstein. And so I step up into the darkness within or else the light in Hamid's tale. However, Atwood does end her novel with a section called the Historical Notes, a satirical piece on the nature of how historians treat people's narratives. This comes as quite a shock to the reader, who has previously been immersed in Alfred's first-person personalised narrative and has become rather attached to her. So then we have the narrative ripped around and dissected by historians. And after they try to fit facts to the story and soon discover that they quite simply cannot, the lecture ends with as many questions as were there at the beginning. We never truly find out what happened with Offred, and that's why the final line of the novel is so irritating. Are there any questions? Through this, we can see that both novels have open endings, which force the reader to think fully about what might have happened to the characters and add more emotion to the text. These characters, Offred and the creature, whom we've become so emotionally attached to over the course of reading the novel, are now given no proper ending, and we are left to speculate. Overall, both novels use storytelling techniques in very similar ways and to very similar effects. Both novels are cautionary tales, but for different things. Both have unreliable narrators, but for very different reasons. And both have almost frustratingly open endings. I think I'm gonna leave it there for today because uh, my throat is getting sore and I'm really tired and you can probably tell that. Um, so next week, or not next week, probably tomorrow,
yeah, I'll probably end up being tomorrow or Monday. Um, I'll be looking at knowledge, prejudice, and possibly men and masculinity, possibly women and femininity as well. So if you want to get ahead, like look at those and then you can yell at me in the comments for getting stuff wrong. Uh, so thank you for watching. I hope that was useful for you. Thanks to the random guy who called me a pretty rabbit. Wow. Um, and I will see you soon. Bye bye.